The Andy Poland Show on ESPN 630, the sports capital. We got Tony coming up at 11 o'clock today. And if the weather cooperates, Orioles baseball this afternoon as they close out the series against Kansas City. Pre-game at 1230 for the 1 o'clock first pitch. Brett Hollander, part of the broadcast crew, concentrates on calling baseball, but has done a variety of things over his broadcast career, as most of us have. Uh, have you ever worked as a weatherman before, Brett? Oh, I pretend to, Andy. I pretend to work as a weatherman. When I was at WBAL uh, Radio and Television, uh, I, I used to get really in, especially if you're doing uh, the sports cast on the local news on television. You, you know, sports comes on right after the weather. Mm -hmm. And I became very close with a lot of these great longtime meteorologists in Baltimore. And I once got a uh, certificate that said I was a junior meteorologist because I'd always pipe in about the weather. So <laughs> I only pretend to actually be a meteorologist, but uh, I... I, I do I do spend some time, I think you have to in baseball, looking at radars and future casts. Yeah, it's funny. Two of my good friends are, are Steve Buckhans and Sue Palka. Worked a long time together at Channel 5 here. Sue did the weather, Buck did the sports, and uh, Buck would follow Sue. And you probably experienced this as well, that the, the words that he cringed hearing in his ear from the producer was, Sue went long, you'll have to cut a few things. So there's kind of this love-hate relationship between the sports guy and the, and the weather person, right? No question about it. And this is a true story. My first professional job in broadcasting was doing traffic reports. So I would do my actual very first day in professional broadcasting was doing beach traffic for an, a station on the eastern shore of Maryland. And uh, that day, I will tell you, I, I made it up. I just said that the Bay Bridge was backed up. I assumed it to be true. It probably was. And I let it rip. Okay. So let me lean on your uh, weather expertise here. What's, what's the chances this game gets in today? I know they want to play. Andy, just because this is Kansas City's only trip in, people don't want to start looking at makeup days later in the year and mutual off days. Baseball these days, we grew up in an era where if you missed a game or two, if the game did not matter, if it wasn't consequential, everyone was okay about not getting in. Those days have passed. They want to play 162 uh, for a lot of reasons. So I think you look down the road and you start thinking about August and September, mutual off days. And you still have a lot of days to make up here in the sense that, you know, there could be future potential rainouts. Uh, so you rather not have to go down that road this early in the season. But this is a getaway day. Uh, both teams planning on leaving. The Orioles have an off day tomorrow scheduled in Pittsburgh. But Kansas City does have a game tomorrow in Chicago against the White Sox. So there's no possibility of tomorrow being that makeup day. You'd have to look down the road. So. I think they want to get in, but it looks uh, bleak right now. Okay, and then there'd be some delays because of thunderstorms. So yeah, maybe by 10 o'clock tonight they can get it finished. And that's kind of the way yeah, they right. do it. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been there, been there, done that, cover those kind of games. You hate them, but that uh, that's, goes with the territory. All right, uh, let's talk about the team. And uh, last week uh, we were talking about the Oriole way. We had Mike Elias on, and uh, and he grew up in Alexandria. He remembers the days of the Oriole Way, I, I don't know if, if, if you do. I know that you're a native of Baltimore and your family's there, so you've probably heard stories about it. But what seems to be building here is, is what happened with this organization from the late 60s into the early 80s. And given the way modern sports works, it, it shouldn't be happening. But, you know, they just keep getting these draft picks who are producing. Colton Kowser, a fir former first-round pick, has moved up off to a great start. Uh, you know, Rutschman and, and the others that, that have come through the minors. This is, this is really, really nostalgic for people like me watching how this team is being built. How about you? Yeah, and I am someone who uh, grew up here hearing about the Oriole way all the time. And it's a way you kind of operate philosophically as a franchise, but it's also a way you teach up and down the minor leagues. And there's a certain way to do things from cutoff plays to bunt plays uh, to how you go about your business. And that's very much what's been uh, installed here by Mike Elias and his team, both looking uh, at the scouting side and also player development they right now have the secret sauce. There's no getting around it when you just look at the success rate and hit rate of young players uh, having lived through many years of Orioles baseball where a lot of highly touted prospects would get to the show and fail. We're in the complete opposite world right now where prospects get here and actually achieve success. Not all of them. And it doesn't always happen instantaneously. But for the most part, players are going through the minor league system, getting to Baltimore, and then succeeding, which is – uh, really what you have to do to keep 
uh, driving forward in the big leagues right now. Yeah, and and you know you 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 look at prospects, and sometimes even if they get off to good starts, they hit a bump, something happens, and uh, and they tail off. What we've seen is a great trajectory from these highly touted players, Gunnar Henderson and Ashley Rutschman. Uh, they've been patient with them, and you know last year at this time, uh, Henderson was struggling. Now he's playing really well. Uh, Rutschman got off to a little slow start. He's gone. So they, they've been patient with these guys, and I think that's made a big difference for them as well. How about you? Well, they certainly have the right – sense of when to call players up and I know fans are frustrated that Jackson Holiday isn't here right now mm-hmm. and he hit another home run last night and I understand that but there are a lot of factors that go into all of these decisions and how do you question right now what Mike Elias and his team have done when they called Rutschman up when they called Henderson up when they called Grayson up and then sent him back down and then he came back and he was everything fans were hoping for in the second half last year. Same with Colton Cowser. They called Colton. Fans wanted him. He got to the big leagues last year and struggled, struggled mightily. Now he looks like he's ready to go. And that's not unusual, but it's there's no guarantee with any prospect. We just had the yeah. Angels here, and that team is just full of first-round picks, and, and so many of them have disappointed. And the Angels historically raced these guys to the major leagues. Uh, Joe Adele was a can't-miss top five, six, seven prospect in baseball for several years. He's basically a bench player right now in his fourth or fifth uh, season in the big leagues getting a chance. And they, they rush all these guys up, and it hasn't worked out for them at all. So I think you want to err on the side of patience. And we know Jackson Holiday will be here at some point, sooner rather than later. And for whatever reason, and it was laid out pretty succinctly by Mike Elias, uh, he believes that Jackson Holiday uh, needs to start right now in the minor leagues. Yeah, uh, and, and I, th- I think that makes sense, too. Um, you know, Mike said last week that best-case scenario, he plays his way into the majors. I thought maybe best-case scenario is everybody stays healthy and they don't need to bring him up and he gets another season uh, of minor league seasoning. But uh, I think that's going to be something to keep an eye on, and, and injuries are inevitable. They're going to happen, and uh, we'll see him. once he gets his chance to come to the major leagues how long he sticks. We're talking to Brett Hollander on Orioles preview, part of the – broadcast team the, the pitching and we got a, a fairly good performance last night at a Cole Irvin uh, he said he didn't mind pitching in the cold because he's from um, from from Oregon and has worked uh, worked in weather like that before but uh, a lot is riding on who is supposed to start today Corbin Burns and I just wonder I know his start on opening day was fabulous but what do you think he means to what is really a young pitching staff around him well, to have one of the few true aces in the game is a game changer because you can give the guy the ball every fifth day and you pretty much know what you're going to get, which is a chance to win. And he's someone, he went six innings his last time. They could have stretched him out further, being prudent early in the season. They had a lead. And uh, now I think you're getting to a point in the next few starts where they can turn him loose. If they need him to go seven, if he's being efficient with his pitch count, he can go seven. Uh, but he is just a Cy Young candidate, and the Orioles haven't had one of those in a very long time, and they may have guys who eventually will be in that class, whether it's Kyle Bradish or whether it's Grayson Rodriguez or Dean Kramer or whomever, but Corbin Burns is one of those very special true aces. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if he's starting the All-Star game for the American League. It wouldn't surprise me in the least if he's top doing the Cy Young award voting. He is a free agent at season's end, and some fans are worried about whether he's staying or Can they sign him? Can they extend him? To me, I look at it completely different. This is a guy who has so much on the line this year. He's so motivated. He's pitching for a good club, uh, and he's got a chance to, you know, really cash in at season's end. It doesn't really matter for whom. The Orioles have a chance uh, to go deep in the playoffs this year because of the ad of Corbin Burns. Yeah, and you've got new ownership in David Rubenstein, who – you know, looks at a, a payroll which is still under a hundred million dollars. Um, that's one of those moves that, if it does work out, you you would resign him here, don't you think? I think you would definitely take a look at it. I'm not sure philosophically if Michael Elias uh, would go there with a starting pitcher. Mm-hmm. I think we looked at this last year free agency, and, and Corbin Burns, I believe, is in a class uh, certainly better than Jordan Montgomery. That's not you no know, knock on Montgomery, but I don't think he's you know one of the you know aces of the game. And then Blake Snell, who's won two Cy Young, certainly is in that class. Uh, all of them have their own flaws. But if you look at how owners and general managers responded to that group of free agents this past off season, I think it's kind of a warning shot that some teams are not 
uh, going to hand out long-term deals for starting pitching just because there's, it's so fragile yeah. and there's so many injuries. So we'll see how that market develops. But um, you know, I, I certainly, if you know a guy like Corbin Burns likes it here and wants to stay, uh, that's something you have to take a hard look at. Yeah, I mean, and I think with the the lineup that he's got around him, and the and the certainty on that too, that that not only are these young guys performing, but they're under club control for a long period of time. Right. So, you, so your roster's not going to turn over, and that's uh, that's a big factor in that. So, uh, I want to get to this uh, in the next segment as well. But uh, there is a, a home run celebration that the Orioles have, and, and Colton Cowser talked about it last night. I don't know if you're, you're aware of this, but there's some, they're using handlebars from a, a bicycle or something like that to, to celebrate home runs? Do you know any of the details on that? I saw it in a dugout. I don't know what's behind it or the reason or rationale for it, but I saw it. Uh, Mountcastle, after he hit his home run a few nights ago, uh, I saw him take handlebars and, and do it, but I have no idea what it's about. Yeah, it's something with a video game. And I'm, and I'm the oldest guy in the world, so it's, too, it's beyond me. But even my, I can't even remember my kids doing it, but it relates to some video game. So that's, uh, that's part of the reason for that. Um, <laughs> last thing, um, the state of Maryland is kicking, was it $600 million in, in renovations for um, yep. Camden Yards? Okay. Has yep. any of that started? Is that, is, have you begun to see any signs of that yet? No, nothing that I can see uh, yet, but that stuff's going to come. I think all the plans are in the works, and uh, they've probably been in the works for some time. And you'll start to see uh, that money. Uh, I mean, there was a big transition here with new ownership and, and uh, new leadership in that regard as far as the controlling uh, person of the ownership is concerned. But I imagine as time goes on, particularly next off season, you will see some of that uh, kind of come into play. I, I got to tell you, I mean, that's one of the great ballparks in, in, in America. I don't know. What, do you know any of the details of how they're going to spend all that money? Because it looks pretty good now. I think the bones are great. The aesthetics are great. It's, you know, to me, it's, you know, something I just love beyond belief. I've been coming here since I was seven or eight years old. But uh, I think there are things you could look at uh, that could probably use an update, whether it's video board, sound system. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure there's other spaces they'd like to utilize and, and update and to modernize the ballpark. Uh, There's probably some things even behind the scenes. Uh, You know, I'm sure there are things here that haven't really been updated or changed since 1992. I mean, there have been updates before, but to use to to really have a a, a big, big update uh, to kind of bring it into uh, what would be 2025, 26 and beyond uh, probably uh, needs to happen. But as far as the look and the beauty of it Mm -hmm. and the layout, I don't think you'll see much change as far as the uh, how we look at Oriole Park at Camden Yards. Yeah, and we know that six hundred million doesn't go as far as it used to. So <laughs> you go through, <laughs> yeah, go, go through that cash pretty quick. Good talking to you, Brett. Good luck in uh, getting the game in today. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate it. That's uh, Brett Hollander, part of the uh, Orioles uh, broadcast crew, both on uh, television and radio, as they are due to close out the series. Uh, this afternoon against the Kansas City Royals, the uh, Orioles off to a, a pretty decent start. Uh, they lost last night, scored only one run. They got 20, was it 24 runs in the first two games, but they're off to a three and two start and they got their ace on the mound this afternoon. We'll talk more about what happened last night and what's ahead as we continue. It's Orioles preview on ESPN 630. Uh, we're doing Orioles preview, which we do every Wednesday at 1030. Just talked to Brett Holland, Hollander, one of the voices of the Orioles, as the O's hope to get in their game this afternoon against the Royals. They lost last night, and uh, unlike the first couple of games of the season, they didn't produce at the plate. Uh, they lost 4-1 to the Royals. And uh, Cole Irvin, starting pitcher, he went five, gave up seven hits, Four runs, all of them earned, a couple of bases on balls, and three strikeouts. And he was pitching like through a steady drizzle and temperatures hovering around 47, 48 degrees. Uh, He said that was not the issue in the loss. I spent four years at Oregon, that's nothing. So, um, you know, not not the conditions you want, right? But, I mean, they're the conditions that were the setting for the game. So you just got to deal with them, put your best foot forward, and do your best to keep the team in it. Stuff was really good. Um, that that second inning there, um, just 
kind of got away from doing things aggressively um, and stayed away from my changeup for whatever reason. And that's just me that I need to shake to it and get to it. And, um, you know, that that's just, um, you know, the tail of the game. You know, when I saw my changeup, it was really good. So um, with everything else, uh, the mix was, was there. Um, got a lot more swings and misses on some spin than I'm not typically used to, so that's a good sign. So uh, a lot of good things going up and excited to have more pitches this next time. <laughs> Yeah, I'd like to get some more runs, too. The Orioles had only three hits on the night. They had six strikeouts, and Brandon Hyde uh, not particularly pleased with what he saw from the dugout. Yeah, tonight wasn't our best night for me approach-wise. I thought uh, we had a lot of early in the count outs. We did a few ball hard, balls hard um, on the nose early in the count. O'Hearn did left. Homer in a lot of places. Uh, you know, gun lined out. Alley there at the end. But, um, you know, we just uh, we thought... We didn't really make Marsh work. I thought I'd give him credit. I thought he threw the ball well. It really kept us off balance and uh, threw a bunch of strikes. But, you know, we need to be kind of a grind out, next guy up uh, type of team. And tonight for me, we just we had a lot of soft outs early in the count. Positive sign after Irvin exited after five. Uh, the bullpen, three bullpen pitchers gave up only one hit. And uh, if you've been watching the Nationals lately, uh, that would be wonderful if they could have a performance like that for Hyde, uh, very satisfying, whether you saw it out of the pen. I thought our bullpen threw the ball great. Um, you know, I thought Webby threw the ball really well. and uh, Heasley there, last couple of innings, did a nice job. It was nice just being able to go inning a piece, two innings with Heasley there, and not have to try to mix and match and, and uh, burn a bunch of guys for tomorrow. So tomorrow, now today, scheduled for 1 o'clock, weather permitting. Corbin Burns, who was terrific on opening day, gets the start. Uh, he's uh, got an ERA of 1.50 and got the uh, opening victory of the year. Now, uh, I talked to Brett Hollander about this a few minutes ago, the celebration for home runs. Teams change them up from year to year. You know, remember the the Nationals would dance in the dugout after they – got home runs and uh, the, the, the baby shark stuff and all that. Well, they, the Orioles have come up with a home run celebration, but I may be too old to understand this. This is Colton Kowser, who's uh, up from the minors, having a good start for them, and their star, Adley Rutschman, on uh, how they celebrate homers. Irvin got us some uh, high school handlebars. Uh, I guess uh, just the explanation is we're on X Games mode. Um so I think, you know, revving up the engines and then the, the handlebars. But like I said, I was just I was I was told that I was on duty for that. Um, so I ran and got them. I don't know if there's a clip of me. You see the home run in the dugout. I, I'm celebrating. I'm like, oh, I got to go grab them. Um, so we'll see if it sticks. I don't know. I know that throughout the season or the beginning of the season, we're trying to figure out uh, what uh, what's going to stick for us. Does it surprise you at all that he was the one to go get the hose last year and now he's found another insane prop to bring in no um not really i wasn't i wasn't here during the the hose but i know that, that was a good one um but you know i don't know where he got them from i don't know if he it's kind of i don't know if he just had them in his house or <laughs> um but yeah uh it doesn't it doesn't surprise me i mean um i think it's good to have a have a clubhouse that uh is kind of bought in on what our celebrations are going to be when did you first start hearing x games mode talk was it spring training or no, it was kind of yesterday. <laughs> um, but I know that he, uh, I know Irvin is, uh, he, he likes those motorsports, things like that. Um, I know a couple guys in the locker room do. Um, so I like it. Um, we'll, we'll see if it sticks. Hopefully you're the next to grab him for yourself. Uh, I hope so. That'd be, that'd be fun. I think we're still trying to figure out what's uh, going to stick for this year. Um, that's something that uh, is always fun uh, at this point in the year to try and figure out what's, uh, you know, what's going to, I guess, mesh well with the team. And I think we're still trying to figure it out. Um, so I think we'll have, uh, we'll have more answers as we get a little further along and find out uh, what looks good and what the guy, uh, gets the guys going a little bit. So, Do we have any idea where Cole got handlebars from? Um, I think it's like, like last year is kind of, I guess, like people like the idea of like opening the floodgates and, um, you know, like rev up the offense or I don't know what it is. It, I think it's more just about like something that looks good and gets the guys going and then we'll figure out afterwards what it ties into that we can, I guess, say that it's all a part of it. Well, they've, uh, what, through five games, they've got six homers. Anthony Santander leads them with two. Uh, Mountcastle's got one. Henderson's got one. Rutschman 
does not have a homer. Neither does uh, Colton Cowser, but uh, he's got a couple of doubles. So, uh, you know, these these things uh, sometimes they stick, sometimes they don't. And 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 asking him where he got the handlebars, what he went to the handlebar store. He got handlebars, so that's how they celebrate home runs. The Orioles uh, due to play today at one. Tomorrow is is supposed to be an off day be in Pittsburgh. Then they open the season for the Pirates, their home opener. That's going to be on four, at 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon. They play there through Sunday, and then they go for three games at Boston. And, uh, you know, the big thing from last year was that they set a record by, was it 84 consecutive series without being swept and they were finally they were swept in the in the playoff against the Texas Rangers. But uh, you know you keep keep winning, keep grinding, keep getting those wins, and that's that's how you stay out there. Now the, the division, um, you know, it's going to be tougher this year. And Juan Soto is just tearing it up for the Yankees right now. Uh, the Red Sox will probably be better. Uh, we'll see what happens with Tampa. But uh, the Orioles to get off to a three and two starts not uh, not terrible, and uh, you're starting to see production. From the stars, uh, the interesting that that Gunnar Henderson, um, who you know Cal Ripken and others said, stop shifting him back and forth from third to short. Well, that's what they're doing. They're shifting him back from third and short. You've had uh, Joey Manessis, uh, Joey Mateo, excuse me, uh, start two games at short, and Henderson has started uh, three of them at short, playing there last night. But it seems like sooner or later they'll have to find uh, find the spot for him. And as Ripken said, it's best to be placed. Shortstop uh, Adley Rutschman uh, plays almost every day, catches a lot of games, but but is the DH, and he's off to a good start, hitting 278. So uh, here they go against the Royals today. We'll see if we get it in. It's a 12:30 start with the pregame here on ESPN 6:30 and first pitch at one o'clock. Thanks very much to Brett Hollander for joining us on Orioles Preview. Thanks to Rex Mintern for running the show, and thanks to all of you who listened. Tony is coming up next, and I'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m.